winding up our study on Satan's devices. <clears throat> this will be the next to last message, and uh, we'll springboard both of them out of Ephesians chapter 6. But two different principles here. And of course, Ephesians 6, <clears throat> most, I guess, commonly known about is the armor of God listed there, and we'll take a look at that next week. But let's begin reading in verse 10, Ephesians 6, 10. <clears throat> the Bible says this, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Put on the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand against the wiles <clears throat> of the devil. And of course, verse 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18 deal with that armor of God and the, the fact that we are, we can read verse 12, says we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness, of the darkness of this world, <clears throat> against spiritual wickedness in high places. It says, wherefore take unto you the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand, verse 14, stand therefore. And we're not going to take the time tonight to look at the armor of God, specifically we'll look at that next week. And uh, how we're to stand against the wiles of the devil. But back in verse 11, it says to put on that whole armor <clears throat> that you may be able to, to stand against the wiles of the devil. We'll look at the wiles tonight. And it's more or less a synopsis. We've talked about some very specific devices. We've talked about some very specific instances where Satan will uh, try to, to trap us or tempt us or ensnare us or deceive us, whatever it might be. We've talked about a number of specific instances. Tonight's more or less an overview, but I want you to see it's a principle of what he's trying to do in our lives. And uh, the Lord showed me this. This will sort of be a, a little bit of what I preached about three years ago on Wednesday night. Y'all remember that? Yeah, I figured. So <laughs> it won't, won't hurt to repeat any of it, will it? All right. <clears throat> well, let's pray tonight and we'll jump right into this. Okay, Father, we love you. Thank you so much for the good day you've given us. Lord, thank you for this precious church, Lord, I love Spring City Baptist Church, and I'm honored, Lord, to be the pastor here at this place, and thank you for those precious folks that comprise this local body of believers, and we just pray tonight, Lord, you'll help us all <clears throat> to listen to your word, Lord, to submit ourselves to it, and Father, that it would be effectual in our lives, help us to learn all we can, Lord, in these next couple of messages about our enemy, and Lord, please help us to stand against the wiles of the devil and uh, Lord, I pray that, that Satan would not be able to destroy this church from the inside. Lord, you'd give us strong homes, strong families, strong individuals that will stand and resist uh, the temptations that he puts in front of us each and every day. And Lord, may our lives be pleasing in your sight. We sure love you tonight and ask you to help us now in Jesus' name. Amen. <coughs> Excuse me. All right. <clears throat> a while. If you look that up in the dictionary, the 1828 dictionary, a while is a trick... For ensnaring. I think today we call it advertising. But uh, anyway, that's what it is, right? It's a trick for ensnaring. It's deception. Here's a Bible word that you will understand and recognize. Well, you may not understand, but you'll recognize it. It's to beguile. To beguile. The word guile means deception. And so to beguile someone is to deceive someone. And if you remember, Jesus talked about Nathaniel, and Nathaniel came to him, and, and uh, they said, We found Jesus Christ of, of Nazareth. And, and Nathaniel uh, said, Well, can any good thing come out of Nazareth? Right? That was guile in his mouth. And, uh, but anyway, so to beguile someone is to deceive someone. All right? It's a trick for ensnaring. And we understand that Satan is the master of deception, he's the master trickster. And over in Colossians chapter 2, if you would turn over there with me, we'll, we'll go a few places here to get started. Colossians chapter 2, <clears throat> the Lord does not want you and I being deceived by Satan. He does not want you and I to be tricked into getting into a bad situation. And we'll talk about what that bad situation is as the night goes on. But here in Colossians chapter 2, <clears throat> the Bible says in verse 4, and this I say, lest any man should beguile you with what? With enticing words. And the reality is, most of the time, you and I will be swayed by words. Now, we understand the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, and all that's out there, but we communicate with words, right? And so the instances we're going to look at tonight 
just about every, I think every one of them, uh, is an instance where enticing words were used and it caused someone to be deceived. It caused someone to be beguiled. It caused someone to be caught in a snare and tricked. And the end of that situation was terrible. It was tragic. The first place we ought to look tonight is Genesis chapter 3. And I tell you, you and I just got to be so careful about who we listen to. Got to be careful about what we listen to. Because those enticing words are everywhere today. Satan is the prince of the power of the air. And he uses the airwaves. He uses the radio waves and the TV waves and the internet waves, if those things exist. But he uses all of that communication to disrupt people's lives. And of course, we've seen over in 1 Corinthians 14 that corrupt, evil communications corrupt good manners. We've talked about that before. Okay, so we've got to be careful about those enticing words. But if you look in Genesis chapter 3, verse 13, it's after Adam and Eve have partaken of the forbidden fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And God is interrogating them. <clears throat> in verse uh, 12, the man said, The woman whom thou gavest me to be with me, uh, she gave me of the tree, and I did eat. And the Lord said unto the woman, What is this that thou hast done? And the woman said, The serpent, what's it say? Beguiled me, and I did eat. How was it that Satan got Eve to partake of that fruit? Did he hold a gun to her head? Did he offer her great riches and physical wealth? Did he come to her and physically take her hand and put it to that fruit and then take her hand and force it in her mouth? No, he just said a few enticing words, didn't he? He beguiled her. He deceived her. And, of course, she's she's speaking truthfully right there. Because the Bible says back in the first part of Genesis 3 that the serpent was more what? More subtle. Okay, now subtlety can be a good thing. Not always a bad thing. Right over in Proverbs chapter 1, the Bible says in Proverbs of Solomon to give subtlety to the simple. God doesn't want us to be simple. Right? He doesn't want us to be gullible. He doesn't want us to be taken by every little thing that's coming and going. He's given us a brain and he's given us the Holy Ghost of God, as we talked about this morning, to give us some direction and some unction from him that we might be able to judge and discern whether or not this is in my best interest or not. So Eve was beguiled, she was deceived, she was ensnared, and what was the fall of that? <laughs> by one man's sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for all have sinned. Just a few words, and the entire human race after that is shaped and born in iniquity. You say, ah, oh, it's not that big of a deal. It's a huge deal. It's a huge Now hold all that in mind, alright, let's go to Genesis 29. Well, I'll tell you what, don't go there. Go to Joshua 9. <clears throat> I'll just mention in Genesis 29, 25 is where Laban beguiled Jacob, right? He deceived him about Leah and Rachel. And um, so that, that's just another, another thing there. Of course, Jacob was reaping what he sowed. We understand that. So Joshua chapter 9. <clears throat> now we're going to read, read a little bit of scripture here. Uh, So we see the context of things, okay? And I'm probably going to have to read a lot of scripture tonight, so just bear with me, all right? But you've got to get the context of all that's going on to understand really how Satan's trying to work and the wiles that he's putting out there, okay? Joshua 9 and verse 1, the Bible says this, And it came to pass, when all the kings which were on this side, Jordan, the hills and the valleys, and all the coasts of the great sea over against Lebanon, the Hittite, and the Amorite, and the Canaanite, and the Perizzite, the Hivite, and the Jebusite, heard thereof, that they gathered themselves together to fight with Joshua and with Israel with one accord. And when the inhabitants of Gibeon heard what Joshua had done to Jericho and to Ai. All right, now pause with me for a second, give you the context from Joshua 1. The children of Israel are coming into the promised land. They've crossed the Jordan. They've, they've conquered Jericho. They got whipped at Ai because of Achan's issue. And then they went back and whipped Ai once they got right with God. And what's happening is all these other nations, all the other people in the promised land, right? That, that whole list in, in verse 1, they're all hearing about Israel. They're hearing about the God of Israel. And they're saying, uh-oh, <laughs> we've got a problem coming. And so verse 3, the inhabitants of Gibeon heard. And it says, verse 4, they did work. And what's the word? Wilily. Well, let's see how they worked. Wilily. And went and made as if... 
They had been ambassadors and took old sacks upon their asses and wine bottles, old and rent and bound up, and old shoes and clouded upon their feet, and old garments upon them, and all the bread of their provision was dry and moldy. Sounds like a Halloween party to me. <clears throat> and they went to Joshua at the camp of Gilgal and said unto him, And to the men of Israel, We be come from a far country. Now therefore make ye a league with us. Of course, that's totally a lie. They're just, they're putting on these costumes, act like they've come a long way. They just came a few, few miles. Seven, the men of Israel said to the Hivites, Peradventure you dwell among us, and how shall we make a league with you? You know, sometimes it's good just to trust your first instinct. And they had it figured out. You know, verse eight, and they said to Joshua, we are thy servants. Joshua said to them, who are ye? And from whence come you? All right, now wait a minute. Is that a specific question? That's pretty specific, isn't it? Look at verse 9. And they said unto him, from a what? A very far country. Okay, can we have that country's name? It's a long way off. Many miles. You see how they're answering? They're answering in a generality. You know how you can tell somebody's lying to you? They're not giving you specifics. They're lying to you. They're just talking in generalities. We come from a very far country. Thy servants are come because of the name of the Lord thy God. Well, that's partially true. For we have heard the fame of him and all that he did in Egypt and that he did to the two kings, the Amorites that were beyond Jordan to Sion and Heshbon to Og, king of Bashan, which was at Ashtaroth. Wherefore, our elders and all the inhabitants of our country spake to us, saying, Take victuals with you for the journey. Go meet them, saying to them, We are your servants now. Therefore, therefore now make ye a league with us. It's our bread we took hot. Uh, out of our houses, they came forth unto you, but now, behold, it's dry and moldy. These bottles of wine which we filled were new, and behold, they be rent. These are garments, our shoes are become very old by reason of the very long journey. It's all a lie. And the men took their victuals and asked not counsel at the mouth of the Lord. There's the problem. And Joshua made peace with them and made a league with them to let them live. And the princes of the congregation swear unto them. That's a dangerous situation right there. And what's happening, you're going to see here in just a minute, what's happening is God told them when they came into the promised land, don't you intermingle with those nations. Don't you intermingle with those people. I want you to drive them out. I want you to kill them. I want you to utterly destroy them. And Satan, though, is working wildly here. And he's going to, what he's going to do is he's going to start mixing these nations in the promised land. And God said, I do not want that. But because Joshua did not ask counsel of the Lord, because Joshua and the elders of Israel and the congregation of the princes were deceived by this lie that the Gibeonites told, you've got a major problem that's going to creep into Israel. Now look at verse 16. came to pass at the end of three days after they had made a league with them that they heard <laughs> that they were their neighbors. <laughs> And they dwelt among them. And they had children of Israel journey and came to their cities on the third day. And their cities were Gibeon and, and uh, Chipperia and Beeroth and Kerjatharim. And the children of Israel smote them not because the princes of the congregation had sworn to them by the Lord God of Israel. And the congregation murmured against the princes. And so it's going to start causing division in the nation of Israel. And ultimately what happens is you get over there. We just covered this in 2 Samuel. If you remember Saul went against the Gibeonites. And when he did that, he went against the word that was promised them right here. And God smote that nation, plagued them. And when David said, Lord, remember that three-year famine? David finally realized, Lord, what's the problem? He said, it is for Saul and his sons and for the Gibeonites. And so David had to go to the Gibeonites and make things right. And once he made things right and got Saul buried correctly, God lifted that plague. God lifted that famine. But how did they even get in that situation? They got deceived. They got taken. Any of y'all ever walked on the uh, street in our Gatlinburg and those people come out trying to peddle those timeshares to you? What do they do? They're working wildly. That's just one simple example. But boy, it happens all the time. It happens all the time. We've got to be careful about that. Not just in physical things, but in, in spiritual things. All right, now, I want you to go to, <clears throat> let's go over to Numbers 25. Numbers 25. It's going to be a, a simple thought tonight once we lay all the groundwork here, okay? Numbers 25. To give you the larger context of what's going on here in the preceding chapters, this is where Balak 
has asked Balaam to come and curse the nation of Israel. And in Numbers 25, (coughs) verse 16, (coughs) the Bible says, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Vex the Midianites and smite them, for they vex you with their what? Their wiles. Wherewith they have beguiled you in the matter of Peor, and in the matter of Cosby, the daughter of a prince of Midian, their sister, which was slain in the day of the plague for Peor's sake. Now, I've read the end of this thing. What's happened in Numbers chapter 25, if you remember, um, is when, see, what was that guy's name? Lord, help me. That's terrible, ain't it? Phineas, right? Remember Phineas, the son of Eliezer? And he saw that, that Israelite man and that Moabitish woman go into that tent to commit fornication. You remember that? And the Bible says he went in there and he put that spear through both of them and, 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 and fastened them to the ground. And it says that the plague was stayed. God, we're familiar with that. And, and, and you know, God was pleased with that. But what was happening was something, someone had told this Gentile nation... How to destroy God's people. And that man's name was Balaam. Look back at Numbers 23. Now, I, you, you know the story. <coughs> Probably I know the story. Balaam was, was hired, tried to be hired by Balak to come and to, uh, to curse Israel. If you look at Numbers 23, 25, the Bible says this, Numbers 23, 25. And Balak said unto Balaam, neither curse them at all. Nor bless them at all. Of course, Balaam had, uh, had refused to put a direct curse on them, right? Because he knew God would kill him on the spot. It says, And Balak said unto Balaam, Neither curse them at all, nor bless them at all. And Balaam answered and said unto Balak, Told not I thee, saying, All that the Lord speaketh, that I must do. And Balak said unto Balaam, Come, I pray thee, I will bring thee into another place. Peradventure it will please God, that thou mayest curse me them from thence. And Balak brought Balaam unto the top of where? Of Peor. That's what God's referencing in Numbers 25. Top of Peor that looketh toward Jeshimon. And Balaam said to Balak, Build me here seven altars, prepare me here seven bullocks and seven rams. And Balak did as Balaam had said, and offered a bullock and a ram <clears throat> on every altar. 24, 1. And when Balaam saw that it pleased the Lord to bless Israel, he went not as at other times to seek for enchantments, but he set his face toward the wilderness. And Balaam lifted up his eyes, and he saw Israel abiding in his tents according to their tribes. And the Spirit of God came upon him. Skip down to verse 25 of of chapter 24. It says, And Balaam rose up. They're going to have a conversation here. Balaam rose up and went and returned to his place. And Balak also went his way. Now, on the surface, it looks like Balaam hasn't done anything to hurt the children of Israel. But God knows all, doesn't he? And he lets us in on something. If you look over at Numbers chapter 31, Numbers 31, just piecing the puzzle together, amen? Numbers chapter 31 tonight, <clears throat> verse 1, the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Avenge the children of Israel of the Midianites, afterwards shalt thou be gathered unto thy people. And Moses spake unto the people, saying, Arm some of yourselves unto the war, And let them go against the Midianites and avenge the Lord of Midian. Now, why does God want this to happen? Look down at verse 7. And they warred against the Midianites as the Lord commanded Moses, and they slew all the males. And they slew the kings of Midian beside the rest of them that were slain, namely Evi and Rechem and Zur and Hur and Reba, five kings of Midian. Balaam also, the son of Beor, they slew with the sword. That's very interesting to me. Because at the end of Numbers 24, it said Balaam went his way. So where did he go? He went to the Midianites. He went and dwelt among those people. And look what it says, verse 9, And the children of Israel took all the women of Midian captives and their little ones, and took the spoil of all their cattle and their flocks and all their goods. That sounds a whole lot like Saul, doesn't it? And they burnt all their cities wherein they dwelt, and all their goodly castles with fire, and they took all the spoil and all the prey, 
both of men and of beasts. And they brought the captives and the prey and the spoil unto Moses and Eliezer the priest unto the congregation of the children of Israel under the camp at the plains of Moab, which are by Jordan near Jericho. And Moses and Eliezer the priest and all the priests of the congregation went forth to meet them without the camp. And Moses was wroth with the officers of the host, with the captains over thousands, captains over hundreds, which came from the battle. Moses said unto them, Have ye saved all the who? Well, what's the problem in that? All right, hold on. Behold, these caused the children of Israel, look, 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 through the counsel of who? Balaam. To commit trespass against the Lord in the matter of Peor. And there was a what? A plague among the congregation of the Lord. Here God says, look, I want you to go kill the Midianites, utterly destroy them. And the Israelites go out there and they keep all the women alive. And when they bring them back, Moses says, what are you doing? Those are the women that caused us to get in trouble with who? With God. And how did that happen? Well, it sure sounds like that when Balaam left the top of Peor and went his way, he went right down there to the Midianites. And here's what he told them. He said, if you'll marry into the Israelites, you can defeat them. If you'll take their men and you'll have families with them, you'll defeat them. Thank God said something about when they got into that promised land not to marry those Gentile nations. You remember why he said that? He said, because their wives would turn their heart away from God. Just like Solomon's heart got turned away from God through his wives. And so here comes Balaam off the mountain, and he goes over to the Midian. And the Bible says there in uh, verse, four, or verse uh, 16, it says, Behold, these, talking about the women of Midian, caused the children of Israel through the counsel of Balaam to commit trespass against the Lord, no matter pure, and there was a plague. All right? Now, you just hold with me. We're probably going to get out here before 7 o'clock tonight. But I want you to listen to this. In Genesis chapter 3, Whose hand was against man? God's or Satan's? Because God said, I've got to curse you. I've got to punish you because of what you did. In Joshua 9, whose hand was against Israel? God's or Satan's? Ultimately, it's God's hand because who plagued them? God plagued them. In the matter of Balaam and Peor, when the children of Israel committed fornication with the Midianites, whose hand was against them and whose hand killed them? It was God's hand that was ultimately against them. And I'm telling you tonight, if you and I don't learn anything else out of this study, I want us to get this. Satan works wily to beguile us and deceive us, listen to me, and get us to partake of sin that God says you don't need to partake of that so that God's hand has to be against his own children and Satan sits on the side and laughs about it. That is the wiles of the devil. Don't you know when Eve partook of that fruit and gave to her husband Adam and he did eat also, he just sat over there and you can almost hear it like this. <clears throat> uh, God, <laughs> your creation has committed a sin. It's almost like over there in Joshua 9 when he's just commanded them, do not intermingle with those nations in the promised land. And he gets those guys to go over there from those Gibeonites to go over there and they get in there. It's almost like Satan just sits back and laughs and says, well, a lot of good that commandment did, God. And then over here in, in, in Numbers, Balaam didn't, listen, Balaam didn't directly curse the nation of Israel. No, he just told them how to get God to curse them. You talk about subtle, you talk about deceiving, you talk about cunning, sly, subtle, whatever adjective you want to put on it. That is the devil, and that's what he's after in my life, and that's what he's after in your life, because he knows God will not go against his word. And when the Bible says, be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. All he's going to do is throw some devices out there. He's going to throw some wiles out there, some temptations out there, and try to get you and I to partake of those sins that God says you need to leave them alone out of your life. 
And as soon as we partake of that, he sits back and he laughs and he goes, okay, God, you better do what you said. I'll tell you guys, he is not our friend. He is our enemy. And every time that you and I give in to temptation, every time that you and I give in to presumptuous sin, every time that you and I are ensnared and deceived, listen to me, it grieves our Heavenly Father's heart because He has to deal with it according to His Word. And Satan just sits on the side and laughs because he got us in trouble, if you will. That's the wiles of the devil. And next time we get together in Ephesians 6, I'm going to show you what he attacks. It's just going to be a synopsis of everything we've looked at. But there's many different ways he's going to do it. And look over at 2 Corinthians 3. Excuse me, 2 Corinthians 11. <clears throat> you talk about making Satan's work easy for him. When you and I give in to the devices and temptations he throws out there, he doesn't have to actively do anything against us. He just sits back and lets God take care of us. What a sad state to be working for the enemy. What a sad situation many people get themselves into. Because they think that they're doing what's best for them. They think that they're doing, maybe even think that they're doing what's right with God. But they're walking right into a trap that Satan has set. And as soon as they're ensnared, as soon as they're caught, he just sits back and and laughs and watches God have to chasten and judge and correct his own children. And maybe bring some hardships and trials into their life. And look... It may not be God's will for that, but when we step over that line into that sin, God has no choice. He has to deal with that sin. You understand that? Well, I can, I can ask for forgiveness. Yes, you can. I can confess my sin. Yes, you can. But did David's problems go away? We looked at nine chapters of problems in David's life, and don't you know Satan just sat over there and laughed? So is that your king? That's the king you chose? Come on, Lord. Hmm. I tell you what we do so many times. We give Satan a, a reason to blaspheme the name of our Savior and to blaspheme the name of our God because of how we act and what we do. <clears throat> Second Corinthians eleven verse one. <laughs> Every preacher would say Amen to this. Would to God you could bear with me a little in my folly, and indeed bear with me. For I am jealous over you with godly jealousy. Can I just say something tonight, Spring City Baptist Church? I am, my personally, as your pastor, I am jealous over you with a godly jealousy. I don't want you giving yourself to the world. I don't want you giving yourself to the sins of this world. I don't want to see you getting caught in the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life. I hate it when we have problems in the church, spiritual problems, sin problems, whatever it is. I can't stand that stuff because I am godly jealous over you. And look what it says. For I have espoused you into one husband that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. When my time at Spring City Baptist Church is over, and hopefully the rapture happens tonight, amen. But when my time's over here and I have to stand before Jesus Christ, I want to say, Lord, I was jealous over your people with a godly jealousy. And I did everything that I could possibly do to get them to bring fruit that will glorify your name. As a pastor, that's my calling. Three, but I fear, lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your minds should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. You know what the simplicity in Christ is? Remember over there when God told those Israelites, he said, if you'll obey my word, I'll bless you. But if you don't obey my word, I'm going to punish you. You know what the simplicity in Christ is for the New Testament church? Just obey what's in the covers of that book. That's simple, isn't it? There's simplicity there. But you know what Satan does? Satan works wildly. And Satan comes around and his devils come around and they work to beguile the minds of the New Testament church. And it says that their minds 
were not transformed, but they were what? They were corrupted. Remember last week we talked about, or last time, it was two weeks ago, <clears throat> that we preached on this, we preached about the mind being the battleground. And the thoughts and casting down those imaginations, right, that would lead us astray and all that. You know what Satan's trying to do in this church and what he's trying to do in your life? He's trying to corrupt your mind away from the simplicity in Christ. And he's trying to get you to say, you know what? I know what the Bible says, but. I know what the Bible says, but I think. Listen to me. Did the children of Israel in Numbers 25, did they know what God required of them? No question about it. But. In Genesis 3, did Adam and Eve know the command of God and what He required of them? But. In Joshua 9, did that nation know that God said, don't you go in there and intermix with those people? Did they know that commandment? It wasn't a new thing. It wasn't a surprise. They knew exactly what God required of them. But. They made their own decision. How did they do that? Satan corrupted their mind. From the simplicity of that is in Christ. In other words, the simple, and, and I don't mean that in, a, in an ignorant way, but the, the straightforward life, the Christian life, is pretty simple in Jesus Christ. Just keep His commandments. Look at um, <clears throat> chapter 4. And I know what Paul's talking about there in 2 Corinthians 11. He's talking about other, other people coming in and teaching other doctrines. You know, that has a problem sometimes too. Uh, where did I tell you to go? Chapter 4. Good. Amen. Chapter 4. <coughs> 2 Corinthians 4 verse 1. Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we faint not, but have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty. There, there's guile. Not walking in craftiness, their subtlety, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, that's deceit, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost. Verse 4, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not. Lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake. You know what Satan's trying to do? He's trying to blind your mind and my mind to the truth of God's word. And he's trying to get us to go any other route, any other way, try any other program, try any other method and means possible to do what God has already commanded us to do in his word. To try to skirt the responsibility that we have as Christians. And he has blinded our minds so many times. And the Bible says there that those uh, whose minds are blinded are those that what? That believe not. You trust your King James Bible. You trust the God that gave you that Bible. Why don't we live it like we ought to? Why don't, why don't we put it into practice like we ought to? You know what I really believe? I believe this. I know, I know once we're saved, we're sealed in the day. I get that. I, we're sealed in the day. I understand that. I really believe this. When somebody that's a born-again Christian knows what God says to do in His Word, and their response is, yeah, but. And they turn that faith away from the Word of God to something else. It gets a little darker in there. It gets a little darker and each time it gets a little darker. And the Bible said <clears throat> in Psalm 119, 130, the entrance of thy words giveth light. But if they want to turn their heart and start trusting Jesus Christ and start trusting this Bible, it's a little bit brighter. It's a little bit brighter. It's a little bit brighter in their mind. So I wonder tonight, where are you? Where am I? Are we playing into Satan's hand of getting God to be against us so God has to curse us and plague us and chasten us and correct us? Are we playing right into his subtlety, right into his wiles? Or are we able to stand against the wiles of the devil 
and not be taken in those deceptions. And next week we'll look at the armor of God and how to stand against all that. All right, let's pray.